Uh, our presenters today uh, are Sara Newhouse uh, from Prevail Therapeutics and Francesca Ferrante and Dee from Freeline. Uh, thank you very much for your time today and for your will to support uh, to DIJ and GCA by giving presentations. Uh, presentations will be in of alphabetical order, which means that Freeline is the first, uh, and I will introduce our presenter. Uh, Francesca uh, Ferrante uh, uh, is the VP, Head of Clinical Development uh, and Pharmacovigilance. Uh, Dr. Ferrante has more than 20 years experience in rare and bleeding disorders. First, as treating physician in the, in the thrombosis and hemostasis center in Italy, and then in different pharmaceutical companies. She joined Freeline in December 2021 where she leads the development of gene therapy programs, including the clinical execution of the trials and the evaluation and interpretation of the trial results. She received her Bachelor of Medical and Surgery degree at the Università degli Stadi di Perugia and trained in clinical biochemistry and uh, internal and vascular medicine department at Santa Maria della Misericordia University Hospital in Perugia. So Francesca, Please uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you very much. Oh, here we go. I should be able, you should be able to see my slides now. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Biliana. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for being um, here today and for allowing me to present uh, the, the Galileo 1, which is the clinical study of a gene therapy in uh, uh, people with Gaucher disease uh, type 1. The very first thing I must say is that this is a gene therapy candidate. This is not a medicine that is already approved. It's only approved to be running trials. And so this information today is not uh, a medical advice or a you know, uh, replace any medical advice from your physician. So please talk to your treating physician if you have any questions concerning your medical condition or your participation. This is only for me to explain you what this is and what we are uh, doing. And as said, I work for uh, Freeline. I am an employee of Freeline Therapeutics. I don't need to tell you what is Gaucher disease type 1, but I want to make some clarifications. Uh, it's a genetic disorder. All our part of the body have a code in our cells that is the DNA. And so in some diseases like Gaucher disease type 1, there is an alteration in one part of the DNA that is called gene. And because of this alteration in Gaucher disease type 1, uh, the cells cannot make enough of a particular protein that has a special activity. And uh, so because it has an activity, it's called enzyme. And this uh, enzyme is called GKs, glucocerebrosidase. So this GKs normally uh, keeps the cells clear from harmful fatty material. And this harmful material, if it builds up in the cells, it disrupts these cells. And these cells uh, will be known and called Gaucher cells. So in the graphic here, you see a healthy function. There's a normal breakdown. And I like to show it as like a hammer that breaks down the harmful material. And so people who don't have this disease have very little amount of this material that is broken because of the presence of GKs. If you have Gaucher disease type 1, there's a minimal breakdown or no breakdown. And so there's accumulation of this material. And so the material builds up. So I like to show the GKs as a small hammer. And so people with Gaucher disease don't have that strong hammer that can destroy the substrate. And so the substrate builds up in the cells. So these Gaucher cells, what they do is that they go all over the body. They go in different organs. And so they can go to the liver, to the spleen, and they enlarge. You know better than me, that is one important characteristic of the disease, to have enlarged spleen or liver. Uh, it goes in the bones, and you can have a, a pain crisis, very painful crisis, or be in a higher risk, and or be in a higher risk of breaking the fractures. It goes inside the bone marrow, that is that part where important blood cells are produced. That's why you can have anemia. If you have low uh, red blood cells, or low hemoglobin, you count. And then you can have a tendency to bleed because also in the bone marrow, the 
platelets are produced and platelets are essential to clot. And so you may not clot well, and so you have more bleedings. Less commonly, but it can happen, these Gaucher cells also go to the lungs, so impairing the lung function. Gaucher disease type 1 is very well treated today uh, with two different treatments. One is the enzyme replacement therapy. It says the, the word itself. It replaces the missing GKs enzyme, and so it helps breaking down the material. Uh, the, the harmful material. It's an infusion, an intravenous infusion, mostly every two weeks or life. The duration of the enzyme that is injected through the vein in the circulation is very short. We call it half-life. It takes very little for the GKs that you inject with the ERT that initially is, is, it creates like a peak in the blood. Then it goes like down in a valley. So you have these peaks and valleys. And this is very likely the reason why the ERT doesn't work perfectly in everybody. As well as we have a, 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 a treatment that reduces the material. It's a substrate reduction therapy. And this is the oral pill. It's given every day. It's, a, again, lifetime uh, treatment, may not address all the aspects of the disease, also in this case. And um, for some patients, there's a, an unpleasant side effects, not only gastrointestinal, but also neurologic side effects. What the so-called target profile would be, the potential future treatment, is uh, one of those. It's what I'm presenting here today, that is FLT201 gene therapy. And I will explain briefly how it works uh, and, and possibly uh, uh, Sarah will also explain maybe in different words. So hopefully by the two today, we'll be able to explain you well. Delivers a working gene. So that gene, that piece of DNA that doesn't work in, uh, Gaucher, in people uh, with Gaucher disease, then we introduce it there and it produces the GKs enzyme. It will be a single infusion and will produce continuous GKs in the work uh, in the bloodstream. The GKs will reach continuously the cells and will continuously remove the substrate. And that's why it's a target profile. It's something that we aim at having with this gene therapy. So how does it really work? We use the positive aspects of a virus to deliver the, the new gene. Viruses have this ability to get into the body and to run quickly to organs and to tissues and infect them, okay? There are some viruses, like the viruses we use here, that have a capsid, a capsule, like a shuttle, uh, that really drives them, for instance, to the liver. What we do is that we remove the internal part of this virus. And by the way, these are viruses, the so-called AAV virus, that are not known to cause any harm in general. But the most important aspect of these viruses is that they don't, they don't reproduce on their own. That means that there's no risk that they go into the body and they become billions. These viruses need other cells to grow. So they're not uh, self-multiplicating. So we know exactly how much we can give and how, how much effect we can have. So what we do is that we introduce in this shield of the virus, it's called capsid, uh, the bit of DNA that is healthy, the healthy human gene that people with Gaucher disease type 1 don't have. And so the virus, without knowing, is, in, is injected and, achieve, and reaches the cells and produce inside the cells the GKs. So you can see in the next slide is the sequence of things that happen. We have said that the gene that contains this alteration in the body of people with Gaucher disease doesn't work. And so there's the buildup of harmful material. FLT201, that is this group of uh, big, uh, small uh, capsids with the working gene inside, goes um, in the bloodstream with an infusion in vein, and from the bloodstream attacks the liver. So goes all into the liver cell. Now, the, the liver cells have the ability to, when they receive the code, the genetic to code, to produce the GKs, but also the ability to throw it out in the work stream once it's produced. So the virus gets to the cells, the cells produce the GKs, the GKs goes into the bloodstream. From the bloodstream and from the, the, the liver cells, 
DG case is constantly sent out. It's not like when you infuse ERT that is only up for a few hours or one day or two, and then it goes down. The liver constantly produces GKs, and so the GKs constantly reaches the tissues and gets into the cells. So constantly can destroy the harmful substances that are uh, in the cells. Very importantly, the use of this bit, little piece of DNA will not change anything about your original makeup the new genetic makeup. The new GK's gene will not mix, will not merge with your other genes. It will just sit in the cell and help the cell other materials to produce the protein that they encode for. So this is an important aspect. What happens then? We are including in this capsid a piece of DNA, the gene, uh, that's why it's called gene therapy, that little gene encodes not for a normal G case, but encodes for a G case with a couple of uh, small changes. And these changes have been used to optimize the action of G case. And that means that compared to the G case that is not modified and that you receive with your team, uh, it lasts longer in the bloodstream, around six times more. And so this longer stays sufficient to reach even further organs. And 21 times as a longer life inside the cells. And this helps destroying the harmful material in the cells for longer. This uh, fold increase in uh, presence in the bloodstream and in the cells that we are describing, we have seen it in what you read there, non-clinical models. This means that we have used as always in development, animal models to see what happens and how much we should give of this drug to have an effect and to be able to stop using ERT or SRT that the patients are currently using. So once we have demonstrated this in animals and all the companies do this, once you prove in animals that it's safe enough, nothing is completely safe, but there's a good safety and it's efficacious, then we have received the authorization to use it in humans. And so we are in this Galileo one trial that is what we call a dose finding trial. That means that you, we give FLT201 to one patient first. We see the effect. We see if there is no safety concerns, no blood levels that change too much, no signs or symptoms for the patient. And so the safety is good. And then we observe the patients for long enough to see any effects. Once you have dosed one or two patients at the low dose, as you see there, that is the initial dose we have evaluated after we have done the preclinical studies, the animal studies, then we decide if we escalate or if we remain at that dose. Uh, at the moment, and this is uh, information that I can share with you because the company has uh, publicly announced, uh, we have disclosed our data on first three patients so far. And we have treated, treated three patients at the same dose cohort. We have not escalated yet. And I can tell you that there is interest and we have several other patients in the, in the making uh, for the trial to be dosed, to be further screened. Um, these three patients, I can share with you what uh, uh, it's possible to share. Um, as Viliana said at the beginning, we cannot share more, uh, much more information, but I can tell you what we have seen in these first three patients that I can share with you today. Uh, we have observed for uh, between five and 20 weeks. So we have between a month and five months of observation. What is important is that for receiving this gene therapy, as the virus is uh, very much attracted by the liver, it could cause an inflammation in the liver. And so we prevent that inflammation by giving steroids, what you know as uh, prednisone or prednisolone. And it's uh, some doses of these steroids are given for a few weeks between week three for, for about 10, 12 weeks. And this prevents the liver to inflame because what is important in gene therapy is that the liver is 
uh, infected by these viruses, but is not inflamed by the viruses. And so it's important to know that we need to give uh, the, some doses of steroids, and it's a high dose only for the first three weeks, and then it's what we call taper down. We go down in the dose till it stops, but it prevents uh, the inflammation of the liver. Two slides to show uh, what we have seen in these patients. We have what we call a favorable safety profile. You can never trust if someone tells you that the drug is safe, but the drug has a favorable profile because we have not seen what you see here, serious adverse events, so events that require hospitalization or important events for the patients. We have seen no liver inflammation, so the levels of the marker of inflammation of the liver, ALT, AST, have remained within the limit of normal. We have had two minor uh, adverse uh, events that are related to the drug, some blood levels that have increased a bit and then have returned normal without any intervention. And we have seen some moderate and, and self, uh, uh, let's say, uh, resolving events related to the use of steroids. The steroids we know can cause uh, gastrointestinal issues or some nervosism or some sleepless nights, and we have to report all this. But all these events are well known as effect of the steroids. So we can uh, definitely uh, conclude that at this dose, the three patients that we have treated have had no adverse reactions uh, that would um, make any concern in terms of the safety profile of this uh, gene therapy. And this is for, for the safety part. What have we seen from, I have almost finished, Biliana. I know that it's almost time. What have we seen in these three patients is that before entering the trial, these are patients with Gaucher disease type 1 that are severe patients. They have little of, or no G case, so a small hammer. In all the patients that we have treated, we have seen over time an amount of G case, G case that increases to completely normal levels in the cells within a few weeks. We have seen between one week and four weeks to increase normal in the cells. And this has allowed all the three patients that we have treated so far to stop their previous treatment. Uh, one patient was receiving ERT and they stopped, and two patients were receiving SRT and they stopped. And what happened to the uh, harmful material? We only have one patient that has achieved enough long time to see what happened to the harmful material. It takes a few weeks. So to the um, patient that has been observed for more than three months, we have clearly seen that the level of uh, lysoGB1, which is the harmful material that was accumulated at the beginning, in three months is really started to reduce. It's about 40% less. So here we have the summary. We have seen that in the first patient, this new GK enzyme delivered with FLT201 has shown to take only about a week to get to normal level with sustained levels in the plasma. You see these people start having GKs constantly produced, uh, well taken from the cells. We measure from blood cells the presence of GKs in the cells and uh, in uh, up, up to four weeks is normal and sustained. And as I said, in the first patient that has been observed enough, we have seen more than 40% reduction in their initial uh, material, uh, lysogb one that is accumulated. Uh, hemoglobin and platelets, even after interrupting uh, the ERT or the SRT, maintain uh, as they were before. I want to just spend, if I have time, a few, few, one slide to show if you want to discuss with your physician, if you want to be eligible for this study, you can discuss. You have to be adult, have a Gaucher disease type 1, and already been treated with ERT or SRT. The treating physician will have a description of what happens in the study. You will be screened to see if you can receive it, and then you will be treated and followed up for about 39 uh, weeks. Uh, which is nine months, more or less, and then you will be monitored anyway for five years. The study has important evaluations. We need to make sure we follow up all the safety and then the efficacy. So you will have weekly blood drones, you will have visits every uh, certain weeks, evaluation of your internal organs and the bone before and after the treatment at the beginning and at the end of the, of the study. I'm sure that these slides, now this is recorded so you can go better through all the details. I'm not gonna spend too much time, but definitely if you are interested, you can discuss with your treating physician um, um, 
both these results and the possibility to participate in the trial. I really want to thank the patients that have already participated in the trial, the physicians that are treating them, and of course, uh, IGA for hosting this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francesca. This is very exciting for, for our patients. Uh, okay, so uh, we have one more presentation. So uh, it will be Sarah Newhouse, uh, Senior Medical Director, Clinical Development, Prevail Therapeutics, a wholly owned subsidiary of Ellie Lilly and Company. Uh, Sarah Newhouse is the medical director of two ongoing clinical stage AAV9 gene therapy programs at Prevail, Eli Lilly. Uh, proceed, a clinical trial for adult patients 18 to 65 years with Gaucher disease type 1, and provide a clinical study for pediatric patients 0 to 2 years with Gaucher disease type 2. Sarah received her medical degree from the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. She completed her child neurology training at Duke University Medical Center, followed by a combined clinical research fellowship in neuromuscular neurology, neurogenetics at the Johns Hopkins Hospital Baltimore and the National Institute of Health. So Sarah, we are excited to, to hear your presentation, please. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm fortunate to follow Dr. Ferrante. Just want to confirm you can see the slides and hear me okay. All right. Fantastic. So thank you very much for being here today. I'm excited to discuss another Gaucher disease type 1 peripheral manifestations of Gaucher uh, gene therapy trial. And um, happy to build on some of the concepts we've already discussed um, and, and repeat some and go into some more detail on the clinical trial for Prevail. Want to start with the same medical disclaimer, just to mention that this is not intended to be medical advice and that these um, drugs and, and assets we're discussing today are under clinical research and are not approved for official use. Um, we'll be reviewing briefly what Prevail is, what we're currently working on, overview a bit of how gene therapy works that Dr. Ferrante already beautifully explained and then discuss uh, what Prevail is doing and some details about our clinical trial, uh, the name of which is Proceed. Um, and we'll be taking chat questions throughout, so looking forward to answering those at the end. Um, just to mention that Prevail Therapeutics is focused on using gene therapies to target neurodegenerative diseases. So we have a number of clinical trials ongoing right now uh, focusing on the different ways that genetic mutations with GBA1 can present and look in patients. So as we know, um, the same underlying genetic misspelling can cause both GD1 and GD2, and in some rare cases, Parkinson's disease. So Prevail is running clinical trials in all three of those uh, medical areas, as well as a clinical trial in a different disease uh, called frontotemporal dementia, but just to mention the areas that are being covered. So let's get in a bit about the mechanism of gene therapy before we talk about uh, Prevail's approach. Um, this was already covered a bit, but I want to go into it a little bit again, um, that the point of this gene therapy that we're using um, is sometimes called uh, gene addition or gene transfer. Um, just to say there's a lot in the news about different types of ways that genetic therapies can be used, such as editing or CRISPR. Um, these words are heard in the news, but that is not what we are doing. Um, what we're doing here is giving your body a healthy copy of something that is misspelled in an effort to make a functional protein, which we discussed uh, is G-case in this case. Um, I'm foregoing the review of GD1 and the disease because that was already beautifully covered and you know it well. So just hopping right into the gene therapy mechanism. Um, so, so the goal here is effectively like a replacement of a flat tire. If you think about driving your car, you get a flat tire, you put on a functional tire and that is able to roll, your car is able to work, but you still have that tire with a hole in it, maybe in your trunk, so the gene that has the misspelling is still in your body, but we've been able to replace it with a different gene that is fully functional and working. And just to mention that this technology is 
very new and um, the trials are expanding all the time, but that this has actually been studied for many, many decades since the 1980s and 1990s, different ways of using viruses, small sort of helper viruses to do something helpful and, and not to cause harm. So that this is new, but to say that it's been studied for, for well over 40 years in animals and in people. So there are different approaches to gene therapy, as I mentioned, um, therapy versus editing, whereas therapy works to replace or transfer a healthy copy and editing works to change the DNA that are in your cells. Um, another area that they can be different is in vivo versus ex vivo therapy. Some of the therapies are delivered directly IV right into your body. Others involve harvesting or removing cells from your body, changing them outside into a dish, and then re-administering, giving them back to you. So I think this was discussed with the community a lot with the Avro Bio trial that's not currently um, active anymore, but there was a lot of discussion on what method are you using? Um, how is it similar or different than some of those other ex vivo trials um, that involve uh, different types of, of medications such as chemotherapy. Um, there are different viruses that can be used, such as AAV viruses that Dr. Ferrante discussed as well, or lentiviruses, and then different types of immunosuppression that can be used. Prophylactic, which means we give you something in advance, ahead of time, or early in the gene therapy course, versus a conditioning regimen that involves chemotherapy. So I just want to briefly highlight that for the Prevail Proceed study, we use the top four mechanisms. So we do not involve um, chemotherapy. We do not involve a long hospital stay. Um, we do not involve something similar to a bone marrow transplant. I know we've received lots of questions around that. So we're doing a gene transfer or gene replacement. We're doing in vivo, which is an IV dosing. We're using an AAV9 virus and we're doing prophylactic immunosuppression. So this allows us to, um, to the best of our ability, monitor patients closely, but does not require long hospital stays um, and, and does not involve um, some of those other medications. Just to show a graphic of, of what we discussed as well, um, we're not editing the DNA that you have in your cells, in your nucleus, for example, that your children would inherit. We're essentially, as that analogy, replacing a tire with a functional tire and it lives next to your new, uh, DNA in your nucleus, pumping out that healthy G-case protein. So we use that AAV9 as a shuttle. Think of it a little bit like a delivery truck. Your post office delivers a package, it goes in into the nucleus and then it functions there alone, making that functional G-case and being healthy. So another question we often get is, um, if, if, a, if I receive it and have a child, will my child inherit this mutation or this, this treatment? The answer would be no. This would not be passed on to future generations. Um, this would be living within your cells and your nucleus and would not be inherited by the next generation. So there are um, good and bad elements of that, but this is not editing or changing your DNA that you're born with or would pass on to your offspring, which is very important to note. So let's dive in a little bit to our study. I, I will say our trial um, accepts patients with what we call peripheral manifestations of Gaucher disease. So that is mainly Gaucher disease type one, um, but we know more and more from our medical experts in the field that Gaucher is really a spectrum um, from one to two to three, and people have some similarities of, of how you feel and, and how um, the symptoms that bother you the most. And, and some patients have more notable peripheral symptoms in their liver and spleen and bone marrow um, and less symptoms in their nervous system. Um, so we are open to patients with mainly peripheral manifestations. So that includes liver, spleen, and, and blood count symptoms, um, but do not exclude mild uh, Gaucher patients, type three patients. So I think those would be something to discuss on an individual basis, but would be an important distinction to note. So 
The aim of, of every first in human study is to assess the safety of the product. Um, and so we are, are, the aim of the study is, can this be delivered effectively and safely? And can we use AAV9 in patients with type one or really peripheral manifestations? Um, all chain therapies need to follow patients for a minimum of five years, which is really deemed uh, by our health authorities, people that oversee and maintain safety. Um, we are recruiting a total of 15 patients for the study and are accepting currently anywhere ages from 18 to 65. And we're working on opening um, additional international sites, uh, currently have uh, four open, which we'll discuss. And we are similarly uh, to our colleagues on the line using a one-time treatment. So the goal of this is that it's a single infusion um, delivered uh, through a peripheral vein, usually in the arm, sometimes in the leg, but usually in the arm or the wrist somewhere, one-time IV infusion. And then we mentioned uh, immunosuppression. Those are common agents, as mentioned, such as steroids um, with an additional medication that functions on a different cell, different type of immune cell, but they are well-studied oral medications um, that are largely very well tolerated. So let's go through our inclusion criteria. We mentioned 18 to 65. We mentioned that you need a clinical and genetic confirmed diagnosis of Gaucher type one. Many patients were really tested and, and diagnosed by their symptoms and their enzyme level. So if that's the case, we're able to help get genetic testing and do that if you don't have it, or if a family member doesn't have it, we can do genetic testing as part of the study. Um, Patients in the PROCEED trial have to have been on approved therapy, either ERT or SRT for at least two years. And let me just mention, it doesn't have to be the same one. This is a question we get often. If you're on different ERTs or you switch to SRT back to ERT, that is also acceptable. Just that you've tried something for two years or longer um, and that you're on something stably for three months prior to trying the gene therapy. So many patients have traveled or there's been shortages or issues or side effects. Many people may change, but that you've been on something for two years. Um, currently for our trial, we are only including patients who haven't had a perfect response to their current therapy. So something about your therapy um, is, is still leaving you with symptoms that are bothersome. So either you still have an enlarged spleen, you still have an enlarged liver, you may have low platelet counts, or you may have some bone manifestations. Sometimes it's bone pain or bone crises. We find these by imaging. So we're, we're doing MRI imaging in our trial and uh, helping to determine these criteria really by that, that imaging. Um, patients have asked us, how, how do I know if I meet these criteria? Um, the best recommendation is to discuss with your physician, visit a site and enroll in screening. And the imaging we do can help determine um, because we're using some advanced uh, 3D imaging and MRI, we can, we can determine based on sort of set criteria if, if your liver or spleen or bone findings meet, meet those definitions. Um, but for a, a first in human trial, we're accepting patients with what's called a suboptimal or an incomplete response. Um, the main things to note for exclusion, um, as mentioned, is for a treatment that's given IV, if you have antibodies in your body, if you have sort of those um, uh, uh, units that sort of fight off infection, sometimes as a product of just having a regular cold or being a grown up living in the world, you've developed antibodies against this cargo, this little carrier. So if your body is gonna fight it off, we're not sure how effective the treatment could be. Um, this is an area of a lot of scientific exploration. Physician, we're working very hard on learning how this impacts treatment. How can we reach the broadest audience? But for now, if you have antibodies against the AAV9, that little um, delivery truck, so to say, if, you're, if your body's gonna fight it off, we can't accept uh, those patients in the study for now. We do know those antibody levels change. I think it's important to know if you are positive, in many months or a year down the road, we don't know if you'll still be positive. So we're very open to rescreening patients. I think it's important to know that this is, um, this is an area that we're still trying to better understand as doctors, as companies, as we move forward in gene therapy. So we have a lot of questions around what does it mean to be AAV positive or negative? Am I positive for life? Am I 
Can I not participate in any trial? For now, each trial is typically testing their own delivery truck. You know, I have a different delivery truck than Dr. Ferrante, so we test our own. Um, you know, like there's a FedEx and a DHL, there's different trucks, so we have different antibodies in the system, so that's important to know. And I just pause on that because that is typically an area we get many questions about the antibodies. Um, and having the antibodies doesn't mean that you um, necessarily had any type of illness. It's just the way that your immune system has developed over time. And many of us have been exposed to these adenoviruses uh, growing up. They usually call it a simple cold. Um, and the AAV is a small uh, virus that sort of surfs on the top of the bigger virus. So typically, uh, it doesn't cause any disease. and We don't even know we had it. All right. So uh, the other exclusions are a bit more straightforward in terms of uh, we use some immunosuppressants. If you have any severe adverse reactions and can't take those, that would be an exclusion. If you have significant neurological impairment, and this goes back to our discussion of accepting some mild uh, Gaucher type 3 patients that have very mild neurologic impairment um, and still have peripheral symptoms in their liver and spleen and bone marrow, they may be eligible, um, and we would need to discuss this with your physician specifically on a case-by-case -case basis on who would be eligible. Um, any history of total splenectomy, some of our patients have received a total splenectomy, and since we're measuring that as one of our outcomes, if you have no spleen, it's hard to measure that, so that would be an exclusion criteria. Or if you have a planned surgical removal of your spleen, we would not want the trial to intervene with your planned surgery. Um, additionally, same with bone manifestations. Some of our patients have had spine or other surgeries. If that's planned in six months, that would be a key exclusion. Um, and then any other severe liver or spleen complications that are not related to Gaucher um, would be exclusion. So I think those are the, those are the key points to note today. Um, let me review our study design briefly, which is quite similar, just slightly different uh, drawing here. Um, as you know, many gene therapy trials are designed to figure out the right dose. Um, and we start with a low, a medium, and a high, and we have to enroll patients in that order. So sometimes patients will say, can I just start at the high dose or start in the middle? We have to do three patients at low, and then when we determine that that's safe, we can move to three patients in the middle. And when we determine that is safe, if it is necessary, we move to the high dose. The study is designed this way so we can assess the safety and the way our drug works at every step. Maybe the low dose is enough. Maybe that is all we need. We don't need to go to a middle or high dose. So at each step of the way we pause, we evaluate the data, most importantly, the safety of the patients who have received the treatment, and we follow them with imaging and with biomarkers in the blood. What is your G-case activity looking like? And as Dr. Ferrante explained, that toxic substance, those bricks, how do we knock that down? The Lysogb1 or Glucif, glucosal sphingosine, how do we make sure that toxic substance is reducing, that your enzyme is high, and that it's safe? So currently, the way the study is designed, three patients at the low, three patients at the mid, three patients at the high. We really watch everybody very closely for the first 12 months, and the five-year is the total follow-up period, and visits space out a bit after that, which we'll show in a moment. Once we've selected the optimal dose from a safety and an efficacy perspective, the way it's working, we would treat six additional patients at that determined dose. So that's where our total number of 15 patients are coming from. Let me show an overview. Oh, I did want to mention... We also have dosed an addition, one patient this year in 2023. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to share any of the details of this patient at this time, but we uh, have dosed a patient and are excited to be able to share that information with you in more detail as soon as we can. So just a brief overview, slightly different way of looking at this. We have a screening period and the physical exam, bone and organ MRI are completed along with a number of questionnaires and then some blood tests, both for safety and for biomarkers. Um, so that screening period is typically 45 days. It's no trouble for us to extend that. We recognize sometimes travel is factored in. A lot of questions around travel um, as well. We know where our sites are located, so we're very flexible with that. Um, baseline and dosing time period where we're getting all of those values repeated before treatment, study visits as shown here, and largely we have imaging, blood tests, and questionnaires, and then space out every six months for the follow-up period. 
All right, so this is my last slide, primary endpoints. We're looking really at disease biomarkers, which are in the blood, looking at your organ size and looking at safety and efficacy, as well as safety values in the blood. And our questionnaires for quality of life are really important. Those are very paramount. How are you feeling? How are you functioning? How is your fatigue? How is your pain? Those are the things that are critical to know we've made an, an impact on as well. So with that, I'll just pause. I think I just wanted to mention briefly the four sites that are open. We have two in the US on the East Coast and two of our sites have just opened in Spain. Um, so we will update as soon as additional sites in Europe and UK are open, um, but just wanted to pause there for contact information. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. This was great. I'm sure that our participants have uh, questions, so please use Q&A box. And before that, we have one in the chat. Uh, why this gene therapy is not available for children too? I think this is for both of you. Well, I can start by saying that um, it's a law, the regulators, unless it's a disease only of the children and young children, it's a regulation requirement to start with adults. And so they also want a specific pediatric plan. So we're working together with regulators to get to children, but they allow it only in a staggered approach. It's like you go younger and younger and younger. So probably it's gonna be 16 and then 14 or 12. And gene therapy, uh, it's very particular because it goes to the liver. And so it depends in, in several, several aspects, whether it will work or not in children. There are treatments approved for children with uh, very difficult diseases as well. So it's a possibility, but we will have to wait the results of the adults. Thank you. Sara, would you like to add something? Mm -hmm. Sure, I would just add that, you know, we also have a clinical trial in Gaucher disease type two, as you know, that's a very different condition. So those are patients that are under two years of age, but I think that information will be really helpful to share with our agencies, health authorities, right? The EMA, MHRA, FDA, and, and share how that experience has um, evolved in children. So we hear you. We also want to be able to go younger and, and, and better. We, we hear you and we're just doing it in a safe approach. Yep, same same thing. Thank you. Uh, another one, uh, where are the centers in Europe for those trials? In Europe, we have, uh, um, Freeline has two sites in, in the UK, which is <laughs> not Europe anymore, but is in the European continent. So it's uh, in Manchester and in London. We have three sites, four sites in Spain. We have, um, two sites in Germany. That's for Europe. Yes. So I, I'm just sharing in the chat the contact information. We currently have two sites open in Spain, and and those are the ones that are available now. So I uh, can't share any any other information, but hoping our German and UK sites are are open quickly. I think. Uh, a lot, of, just, to, just to say, a, a lot of regulatory agencies with COVID um, had really long delays. So a lot of the drug trials, I think we've all been yeah. negatively affected by how long it is taking to get sites open for patients to come. So we're, we're pushing as much as we can for that. Um, we hear you, it can't be fast enough. <laughs> And yeah. I can, I can, um, I want to say something because the fact that me and Sarah, I don't, I didn't know Sarah before, but I think we both shared the same feeling is as, as she said, you may have antibodies against these vectors, these capsids, and you may have for one and not for the other vice versa. So, uh, we, we like, we like to not consider ourselves competitors, but complementary. So please always look at all the possibilities. The fact that you have one antibody doesn't mean you cannot go to another trial. The yes. inclusion criteria may be slightly different, so yes. you need to ask. And I'm sure I speak for Sarah too by saying that for sure both our companies, my company does and Sarah will not, we support traveling. So if there's no uh, yes. study in your site or even in your country, in many occasions, we are able to arrange for you yes. stay away, next to the site, travel every week to go to the site. We are really supportive of having the possibility for all the patients, both uh, Freeline and uh, um, um, 
prevail. Prevail. Yes. Oh, yes. Why do I? Yes. <laughs> Both free line and prevail. So Absolutely. for sure, ask your doctor because they have connection with all other doctors that may participate in these trials. That's very important. Thank you. I agree. Yeah, thank you for this answer because we also have greetings for you two from uh, South Africa. And uh, this was also the question is it possible to travel to the. Uh, yes, we can outside. arrange. This, this can be arranged because these are difficult studies and there are a lot of sites that don't have what we call the accreditation to do these trials. And they may be able to follow up after a while, but at the very beginning with all the strict rules, you need to be on a site that is accredited for gene therapy. That's why we allow traveling. Absolutely. And, and I just to mention, um, you don't have to pay at first and be reimbursed. I know yes. patients have asked, do I have to pay myself and, and be out all of this money are uh, very the same. I'm sorry. I don't know. If we're the, so you don't have to put out all the money first that no. travel is covered and arranged. So you should not feel like you have financial distress from participating. Yes. Thank you. Another one, uh, during the start of the therapy, one to two week period, do I need time off work or can I carry on as normal? Well, I think we will respond depending on the schedule of visits. In, in, in the Galileo one, there are the first week, it's quite demanding because it's like every, every day, day one, day two, day three, day five, day seven. So for that week, you know, it's like, it's very often, unless you live just really nearby, the first day at least you have to stay a few hours in the hospital for observation. Then it really goes down to, we do provide, and I'm sure that Prevail does the same, home nursing for a lot of blood draws. Yes. So you don't need to go to the site every time there is a visit. It will be a nurse going home and doing the visit. So you want the nurse going to your workplace that may be it's more difficult but it's not excluded so i think that it will all depend on um on let's say the schedule of assessments it's very demanding at the beginning but it doesn't preclude to make any work um normally and and i would say outside of the first day where we're really 24 hours monitoring you do not need to stay in a hospital for a month i think that was another question and, and I know that the Avro bio trial is not ongoing, but we're still working hard to distinguish the differences. So yes. other studies have said you have to be in a hospital setting for a month or three months. So close by to a lab center or with home nursing, but doesn't mean in a hospital bed. You don't have to be admitted to a hospital. So that is similar as well. I think the first week is the most demanding, um, depending on what type of work you do, um, how you're feeling. Yeah. Um, I think it's safe to say that. And then typically the first month, we like you to be near the dosing center because that's really the doctor who's the expert in your disease and in the gene therapy. So more for safety, but we understand. We understand the burden is high. Uh, another one, once gene therapy has been received, will this last for a lifetime? <laughs> Uh, okay. There's no evidence because uh, there's not so long evidence. There is evidence that it lasts for very long, uh, up to 10 years in some uh, older studies. And um, in, in uh, Freelines experience, we have patients treated with the same virus and the same vector in other disease areas, like in hemophilia. And we have patients now for five years. And once you have gone through the first few months where your levels level to let's say your target levels, they remain, they really remain for years and years. Um, we can't tell you that is a lot once in a lifetime only, but it's for sure we can tell honestly that it can last up to 10 years. And it may be more, it's just that we don't have more data. Exactly, I think that's one of, durability is one of the biggest questions in the, in the trial. Um, you know, I think right now we're looking at a therapy like ERT that's only lasting two weeks. So if, if AAV or, or other gene therapies are able to last on the order of years, that's a very large progress from currently. Um, the best case scenario is it's lifelong, um, but that's what we're doing. That's the point of the study and trials, yeah. Your hope. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay, uh, you already answered in your presentations, but there is a question, what are the risks to a patient when receiving gene therapy? So if you can. That's a very good question. Um, as said, um, 
it depends on the baseline conditions. That's why we have very strict exclusion criteria. We can't enroll patients that have very bad liver conditions. For instance, they have fibrosis or they, you know, that have, um, that they are not well from other perspective of, or have other important diseases. So uh, if, sorry for the only, if you have only the Gaucher disease type one, or in the case of Sarah, you know, the one with the uh, peripheral manifestations, in any case, you are eligible, and that means that the safety profile that we are showing applies to you. The risk is, the major risk is that these viruses go to the liver, and so you can have not what we would call an hepatitis, but you can have an inflammation of the liver. And uh, in the experience, in the general experience, besides some very, very dreadful diseases in very young children with very high gene therapy doses, where even uh, um, there have been reported deaths, and everybody knows, so we have to talk about it, but it's a specific bad liver condition in people, uh, children with no life expectations, with very high doses needed, and that's where we had the deaths. You cannot compare different gene therapies uh, among themselves, but for sure, at the, at the levels that we are giving in our trials, and with the monitoring, that's why you have so frequent blood draws, because we need to check. And with the steroids given, the liver inflammation, uh, again, I speak for the all, basically 20 patients we have treated so far with this vector. It's very mild, asymptomatic. You only can see it because testing, you see the right. ALT, AST right. elevation, and you give steroids and you control it with steroids. There has no been other uh, important uh, risks that are uh, identified. The risk that I need to mention is the, the doubt that everybody has is that this piece of DNA integrates with the body and goes yes. into future cancer. This has been also published in the past. It was a completely different delivery system with a different virus, a different DNA used. Now we are going into what we call, it's like circular. You can't integrate with something that is a stripe because it's circular and it doesn't go in. So the integration um, has been described, has been published. And as we say, your genetic makeup is not gonna be altered. So that risk, we cannot predict precisely, but it's very, 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 very low. I don't know, Sarah, you can, of course, add. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we call these immune responses because we're giving your body a virus with the viral part cut out. So we're using that delivery truck, but your body doesn't know that that is a good virus, right? Your body is designed to fight a virus. If it's the flu, if it's COVID. Um, so your body is saying, hey, what is this? There's a lot in here and it's responding. So patients may get a mild fever. They may feel nauseous. Um, they may have, um, you know, a loose stool because it's a virus and your body is releasing chemicals. So you may feel that way. And it doesn't know that it's a good virus with a good DNA. So a lot of the medicines we give are to reduce or, or make that mild response. Um, and I think those are the risks that we're, we're focusing on. How do we manage your body reacting to that dose? And it can be in some of the ways, as Dr. Ferrante mentioned, really in the liver. And, and we are able to manage those with oral medications for now. And um, uh, we're learning with every additional trial because these are slightly different viruses for slightly different diseases. And in, in cases in very severe young pediatric populations, those, those kids are starting off much more sick in many ways than a lot of Gaucher type one patients. They have a lot of other heart breathing problems. So it's very hard to say what happened on that trial will happen on this trial. We learn, we learn from everything. Um, but I would say the number one area doctors are focused is controlling that immune response. Thank you. And the last question is, uh, what is the age limit for a person to be candidate for gene therapy? I know it is not the same for all. I think we're a little different. So our trial is 18 to 65. Dr. Ferrante, I think yours is a bit different. I think so. So we go from age 18 up until age 65. And we may uh, 
have no upper age limit if there's someone. Yeah. But for now, we have age 65. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have an upper limit. We don't have one. Uh, of course, if you are in super good health, besides the Gaucher disease and you are fit, you are eligible for uh, for the free line. I think that the eligibility is at, at first your will. I always said uh, to my patients that if you have a treatment today, if because someone was brave in the past and, you know, have participated in trials. Now, yeah. I appreciate that this is not a simple trial like all the others for an ERT where you give something and if it doesn't work, you just give it back. And so you may be worried because it's something you take. But of course, if it works, it will be a life changer. If it doesn't work, you will continue with, with what you have. And so discuss it with your physician because it's very important for you to understand. And even signing off for one of these trials means having the blood draw to see if you're eligible, if you have all the things in place, your genetic part, your antibody part. And then you can in any moment decide, no, I don't want to do it anymore until Till you've done it so it's just for you to know if you're eligible and then you want to think about is the same you you if, until you receive it you can always withdraw uh, even if you sign for uh, for having the test done thank you so much uh, for all your presentations and uh, and uh, all answers uh, to these questions uh, so uh, this was a great uh, webinar i'm very happy uh, for being part of this uh, thank you very much. Uh, this webinar is recorded and will be on uh, social media of International Goshe Alliance and Goshe Community Alliance. Uh, good night and see you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Take care. Bye.